Okay, the meeting's now being recorded. So, I'd just like then to welcome Sarah Hunter. Um, Sarah's a certified midwife in the United States of America, but is currently living in Canada with her family and is working as a clinical herbalist. Um, she has two children and a third baby that's on, her, on its way and has got actual, uh, she's got personal experience actually of um, suffering from cholestasis, uh, obstetric cholestasis of pregnancy. So she's going to be looking at that and what midwives need to know. So over to you, uh, Sarah. Hi there. I'm really excited to be here today. I've been attending this conference for a couple of years running and I've heard some amazing people. And I'm um, really excited to be part of it and sharing my um, favorite topic, <laughs> cholestasis of pregnancy. <clears throat> So as Anna said, I'm, I'm pregnant with my third baby, so if you hear me um, breathing too loud, <laughs> that's why I'm slightly out of breath already uh, this early in, <clears throat> and I have to clear my throat a lot. So we'll just start off with the the uh, the words, interhepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, it's also known as obstetric cholestasis, uh, it used to have a whole bunch of different names. Um, including icterus gravidarum, uh, just meaning jaundice in pregnancy. Uh, a lot of people like to throw in an, uh, an extra O after the first E in cholestasis. They want to say coleostasis because it sounds pretty nice, but it is indeed cholestasis. So intra meaning within, hepatic meaning of the liver, um, a cola means bile, and stasis, of course, means stasis. Um, uh, so the disorder is within the liver. It's actually not in the bile duct. So if people have their gallbladders removed, they can still have cholestasis of pregnancy. So <laughs> the etiology, there's going to be a few slides like this where they're kind of uh, vague. It's like, well, we kind of don't really know much about this either. Cholestasis is um, kind of poorly studied. There, um, there are a couple of teams now working um, on new uh, new research um, in the UK specifically and also in Sweden. Um, so there should be more stuff coming out, but as it is, we don't really understand very much about it. So as these quotes say here, the etiology of ICP is complex and not fully understood, likely to result from cholestatic effects of reproductive hormones and their metabolites. Um, the etiology of fetal complications is also not well understood, possibly directly linked to the bile acid, which we will um, uh, get into a little later. Should I turn my mic up? I hear someone saying, I see someone saying my volume is not. My computer too, because it's the Lapped up with the mic inside it. <clears throat> so that was etiology. The uh, epidemiology is also uh, very varied. <laughs> so depending on what country you go to and what year the study is from, the rates vary incredibly widely. From uh, there's a study from China um, saying that the rates are 0.05 percent of people of pregnant women have ICP, and then uh, Chile has the uh, highest incidence, and I see my picture is not here all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, well. Um, Chile has the highest incidence with, at 10% with higher rates in uh, women with of Araucanian Indian descent. Um, higher incidences are also reported in winter months, uh, with, also with twin pregnancies, and of course hepatitis uh, is a, a risk factor. Sorry, I'm nervous. I'm talking really fast. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm better with big groups of people that I can see. <laughs> so, uh, commonly held beliefs about ICP signs and symptoms. And I'm realizing this is the old version of my slides, you guys. Anyway, that's okay. I can work from these. <laughs> Uh, so, in my travels around the internet and talking to my colleagues, this is pretty much what I thought until I started studying cholestasis. 
Um, this is generally what I see going around on listservs and on Facebook and whatnot. Uh, Paritis of the ponds and soils, uh, i.e. itchy ponds and soils, jaundice, uh, onset in the third trimester. And these things kind of get thrown around everywhere you go. Someone's itchy, like really itchy, but if it's not on our palms and soles, don't even look into the rest of the symptoms. I see this commonly. Um, so does this sound about right to the midwives on the list in terms of signs and symptoms? Do you want to show me like a, I think you can agree or disagree with your status there with a the little man with his hand up on the top left. This is pretty much what I was taught and what I retained, anyway, until I started studying. And right, it's with no wrath. Absolutely. So uh, it's sort of the beginning of the sentence. I uh, let's get to my next slide. Um, so, paritis is often generalized. This is um, well known and is in even my uh, 20th edition of Williams Obstetrics is lying around the house. Paritis is generalized. is a basic symptom of um, ICP. Uh, it's commonly experienced on the limbs. A rash may appear uh, but more likely from too much scratching. Uh, excoriation marks can also appear, so I had a picture here too. <laughs> because, <yeah. clears throat> and uh, these symptoms worsen at night. Um, jaundice is incredibly rare. Well, not incredibly rare. Jaundice is relatively rare. If you're waiting for someone to get jaundice, you may wait forever. Uh, dark urine. <clears throat> Dark urine is a, a fairly common um, symptom, sign rather. Uh, pale stool is another one that's not well known, uh, but quite common. Uh, right upper quadrant pain is an interesting one, I find. Uh, if you have a client with right upper quadrant pain, you don't have to jump straight to uh, preeclampsia and other more serious things. You can think about closed faces as well. Uh, Theateria, <clears throat> which is an excess of um, fat in the stool, um, which can also be leaky and kind of gross. Anorexia is another symptom that we don't talk about. Um, people with liver disorders often stop wanting to eat, and cold stasis is no, uh, uh, is no different. And the onset may be as early as eight weeks. So this is now found in the literature, the onset being that early. Uh, but a lot of studies keep repeating the onset in the third trimester uh, myth. Um, for myself, I've definitely found in my fir very first polysthetic pregnancy, I was scratching from the second trimester and didn't recognize it as it had nothing to do with my hands or feet. Associated complications. There are quite a few associated complications. Excuse me. Um, they're largely for uh, the fetus or newborn. Uh, preterm delivery is really common, either by exogenic or spontaneous preterm delivery. Interpartum asphyxial ex events. <laughs> excuse me, I'm so nervous. Uh, meconium staining is quite common. You can see 16 58 percent in um, a meta analysis studies that they did. Um, and sudden IUSD. Sudden IUSD kind of deserves a slide of its own. Uh, as you can see, clusters around 37 to 39 weeks, um, with, depending on the study, 10 to 15 percent. <laughs> Thank you guys for the chat. <laughs> so IUSD can be up to 10 to 15 percent. <laughs> Of, of cholestatic pregnancies, it, it, it's an extreme number. <laughs> I start to get nervous as a care provider when my statistics go into the full percentage points. Once they get into the double digits, I'm terrified, <laughs> especially uh, when it comes to IUSD. 
it, it's um, uh, it's worth taking a moment to think about uh, anyone who's itchy <laughs> during pregnancy. Of course, with active management, uh, I'm looking at this one particular study by James and Williamson, 2009. With active management, they found the rates would go down uh, to about 3.5%. Um, and then a study we're going to talk about a little later, um, uh, the glance hepatology article, they actually managed to get the associated complication of IUSD down to less than a percentage, approximately to 1.6%. Um, with a different kind of management as well. Low APGAR scores at five minutes is another issue, uh, RDS, and postpartum hemorrhage. You'll notice most of these are issues for the baby and not for the mother, TTH being pretty much the only associated complication um, uh, intrapartum. So lab tests. I find this is another place where uh, care providers are n either not educated or have forgotten um, what to do. <laughs> uh, liver function tests should be done. Uh, they're supportive, but they are definitely not diagnostic. I know there's definitely places in the world, my, where I live specifically, where we only run LFTs. And, uh, for a lack of uh, the other testing being available, believe it or not. Um, so you will see changes in the liver function test, um, ALK, bilirubin, ALT, AST, et cetera. The only diagnostic test for ICP is the fasting uh, fractionated serum bile acid test. Um, there's some argument of whether or not it needs to be fasting. Uh, in different parts of the world, uh, they do fasting or just random um, serum bile acid tests. Um, so that's something we're uh, looking into for the research, I mentioned. <clears throat> uh, Prothrombin time may be increased. This is something really good to know for midwives. Um, if you're ever going to consider a home birth for a client who has uh, cholestasis, uh, it would be really good to know her prothrombin time before uh, more seriously considering. Uh, the results of the, all of these tests uh, may fluctuate and definitely need to be repeated as the pregnancy advances. Um, the disease process can also um, worsen, can and usually do worsen unless treatment is undertaken. So the fractionated serum bile acid test, they break, when they're fractionated, they break them down into the cholic acid, deoxycholic acid, and quinodeoxycholic acid. Um, the normal values um, depend on, of course, the lab and the place where you're living. Uh, a general lab value is, uh, normal lab value is under 10 micromoles for the total or 3.1 for cholic acid. Um, in a woman who's just starting a cholestatic pregnancy, um, with, uh, early on in her symptoms, may have a very normal um, total bile acid, uh, but the cholic acid will be the first thing to rise. So that's why it's worth fractionating them and not uh, using the whole, the total value. So depending on the lab, like I said, 10 is a general line that the labs use as normal. Uh, some labs say 12 or 14. Um, most importantly, you need to look for a change. If they're increasing, then and you have someone who needs to be followed more closely. And again, all of this needs to be repeated. <clears throat> so in terms of risk, um, uh, this is this uh, glance hepatology article, as it's lovingly referred to in the ICT group, <laughs> Uh, I think is the most important part, uh, piece of research that's been done, uh, like ever, on cholestasis. Um, so what they did was they uh, studied all of the pregnancies in the part of Sweden, um, and 1.5% of them were diagnosed with ICP. And uh, just to take a little aside here, <laughs> it's an interesting statistic that they found 1.5% when they 
specifically went looking and screened everyone with that specifically in mind. Um, the studies that I see coming out of um, different countries that are very, very, very small numbers, I wonder if they are incorrect. I worry a lot after being a sufferer myself and spending years on, uh, you know, there's a Yahoo group and there's a Facebook group and uh, um, now there's new online forums and stuff. So many women come in and they can't even get their care providers to take them seriously. You know, they're kept they're kept awake at night by um, scratching. They can't sleep. They can't uh, they can't relax. Um, they're in serious agony and their care providers are saying, yes, yes, <clears throat> itching is normal in pregnancy. It'll go away, dear. <laughs> and I'm not sure why that is. Is that there's um, uh, a lack of education on the part of care providers or a lack of listening to the women in general. Um, but I'm thinking this statistic here we see uh, with 1.5% is probably a, a world kind of average. But I, again, I don't have research to say that. <laughs> it's just my feeling after um, being around. Um, so what they found uh, in this um, uh, prospective cohort study was that the probability of fetal complications increased by 1 to 2 percent per additional micromole of serum bile acids. So these are very important. They also found that fetal complications did not arise at all until bile acid levels were above 40 micromoles. So this is why it's so important to do the right testing. Um, so what they did is they defined the difference between a mild form of cholestasis of pregnancy and a severe form, with 40 being the, the, the line. So anything above 40, they, um, they suggest here, our data, do, yeah, they suggest here that if your patient is with, has bile acids below 40 micromoles per liter, that their data don't indicate that this group would benefit from induction of labor before term. Um, basically, they say is a mild form with no increased risk, or very few. So they found 693 cholestatic women, which um, to me is, you know, it's not a, like a giant sample size, but in terms of cholestasis is what we have to work with. There's not any other study with bigger numbers. This is as good as it gets. I actually, let me back up, I actually brought this study to all of my care providers. I littered them around my city. Like, please read this, it's very important. Um, fetal evaluation tools. So this is kind of a depressing slide too. Um, we don't really have fetal, fetal evaluation tools that are proven to uh, be useful for cholestasis. Ultrasound, biophysical profiles are not a reliable measure of fetal well-being with ICP. They don't help at all, which is why the Glantz Hepatology article is so interesting to me, because the serum bile acid is the most effective tool we have. Once you get the number, once you, if your client stays below 40, the risks stay incredibly small. And as soon as we get above that magic number, um, things increase. Uh, for midwives, that might mean um, changing care providers as well, depending on your your laws and various other things. <clears throat> so there are medical treatment options for ICT. The, there's one medication, and I had a beautiful chemical structure here on my uh, other set of slides, uh, but you're missing that, you can Google it. <laughs> Earth of the oxycholic acid, uh, it has a bunch of different names. It's abbreviated down to U UDCA, uh, has a bunch of brand names, Actigol, Isodiol. Um, most of the women with ICP could just call it Urso. So it stimulates the biliary secretion and can and um, bring down um, the bile acid level into, I mean, hopefully, um, hopefully into re a regular number or a lower number. So it will also work to, as it decreases the uh, bile acid levels, it will also decrease the symptoms. So a lot of women find um, a decrease in symptoms, 
um, as well as can stay in the low risk category of ICP. So the other medical treatment options are induction of labor. As we saw a couple slides ago, um, the IUFD rates skyrocket sometime around 37 to 39 weeks. Um, and so in higher risk situations or places where uh, proper testing is not available, induction of labor is definitely recommended. And uh, I would make an argument that we've also indicated. Uh, this is one of the few places where I think <laughs> induction of labor is really, 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 really indicated. Um, vitamin K is also a medical treatment option for women. Um, the post-static women will have um, will often have lowered vitamin K um, levels um, due to uh, problems with the reuptake in the colon, um, and therefore the baby as well can have low vitamin K numbers. So uh, levels, sorry. Um, so vitamin K can be indicated both prenatally and is absolutely indicated uh, postpartum for the newborn. If that's something you um, often uh, leave as an option uh, for uh, your clients, this is something uh, that has a real, real indication postpartum for the newborn. Uh, alternative and complementary treatment options. <coughs> So uh, the, there are, I always start with herbs because I'm a clinical herbalist myself. <laughs> uh, milk thistle seed and dandelion root are two very safe, uh, in general, herbs um, that can be used as cholestasis. They're just uh, um, gentle yet still strong um, liver. Um, dandelion is more of a drainer. Uh, the milk thistle, uh, there, and people do have a lot of success with them. Uh, acupuncture, I always recommend acupuncture for pretty much anything. Depending on the person, people get a lot of relief from acupuncture, both for symptoms of ICP um, and for uh, the, the related liver problems. So some of the supplements are kind of interesting. Um, I don't know how useful, but definitely interesting. <laughs> Sam E, if you remember that from way back in the day, uh, actually enjoyed some time in the sun for uh, cholestatic pregnancies. Um, there is a little bit of research that went on uh, with that, as well as for guar gum and activated charcoal. Um, just enough research with small enough sample sizes that, you know, one person came along and said, oh yeah, this works for sure, and then another person came along and said, no way. <laughs> they may be worth trying anyway, depending on um, your client's uh, motivation or desire to do things naturally. Um, bare bile, I put this here just because it's an interesting point, point more than anything. Bare bile is used in traditional Chinese medicine, contains erythrodeoxycholic acid, uh, and so it has been used for liver disorders since they started harvesting bile from bears, whenever that was. Um, I see a question about prothrombin time and vitamin K, and I can get back to that in a second. Um, dietary changes, a lot of women find uh, um, a decrease in symptoms and a uh, decrease in uh, symptoms and problems related to cholestasis with uh, serious dietary changes. Uh, there are some women who find their disease process pretty much disappears if they go to low to no fat diets. Uh, I think you have to be pretty motivated to have no fat in your diet. It's uh, very, very, very difficult. I've seen some people uh, discuss it on the message board. And, uh, <clears throat> if it works, it works. And if it decreases your risk and you're willing to do it, I think it's definitely worth, worth trying. Uh, it's really difficult, but worth trying. Increased fiber for the same reason as uh, lowering your um, fat, because fiber uh, helps um, clean up the fat from the system. Um, apple cider vinegar, lemon and lime juices. Um, again, these are all um, foods that help to move the liver and can be used in um, 
uh, in liver disorders in general, there's cold cases especially as there's food sources and so not contraindicated in pregnancy. Uh, I myself had a lot of amazing success with fresh lime juice uh, during the uh, lime season we, <laughs> we have over here where I could get a bag for a dollar. Of course, once the price went back up, it got a little more tricky as I was having a bag a day of, <laughs> of lime. I did manage, however, to get my symptoms to disappear completely, which I think was a, a very interesting and interesting. <laughs> uh, luckily, I had a craving for lime juice, and I wasn't just um, forcing it down my gullet in every glass of water. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> it might be difficult if you're not having a craving for lime juice, however, uh, to consume that many <laughs> in, uh, on a daily basis. It also uh, doesn't do so great for the heartburn, you guys. <laughs> it's uh, for a pregnant woman, yeah, you, you got to weigh risk versus benefits as, as usual. Um, comfort measures. So I was discussing the slide. <laughs> they had a really funny picture for this one, actually. Uh, I was discussing the slide with somebody uh, just the other day, and we uh, we realized how kind of how sad it was. Um, mentholated creams. Uh, they suggest 2% menthol or lotions or powders. Um, there's, uh, if you go, if you follow my links that I'll show later on, you'll see uh, that all, <laughs> everyone at the ICT swears, uh, in the UK, swears by a mentholated cream. Um, there's also powders like the, the Gold Bond powders we have here in North America. Gold, and I think they're called Gold Bond medicated powders. They're typically used by your grandparents, at least the if you're my age. <laughs> uh, cold water immersion is the, the uh, picture I had of a woman with her um, legs in a bucket of ice water. Now, if you, if you picture how pleasant that must be, you have to realize um, just in what state of discomfort you need to be in to find this to be a comfort measure for your symptoms. So, you know, when you get to the point where you're itchy enough that you're scratching yourself until you bleed or pouring ice cubes into a bucket and finding it relieving for your symptoms, you're, you're in a bad state. Um, and so, yeah, if that's your comfort measure, uh, then that's your comfort measure. But this is what uh, women's ICT deal with uh, on a daily basis, um, often enough. Uh, acupuncture can also work to relieve some of the symptoms. There are some uh, fairly easy uh, points that you can access yourself with ac acupressure that helps to relieve itching. And I suggest if you have a close set of patients that she talks to her own acupuncturist about that. So like I said, I spend a lot of time uh, following the boards and listening to people on the Yahoo groups and stuff. Um, and I found it was an excellent, excellent way to learn uh, about um, a disease process because you get to hear the human side of it and that, the women saying the key words. Um, and um, so this is, these are some of the gems that I learned from being there for so long. Uh, we are often ignored. When it's cholestasis, I find them everywhere now in my travels around the internet, but also on the list, people just come on constantly saying, nobody is taking me seriously. No one is taking me seriously. I can't sleep. I can't stop scratching. I can't eat. I'm sick. <laughs> and they're telling me it's normal. Uh, and um, this is where the education needs to change. Um, any itching in pregnancies needs to be further uh, looked into any itching in pregnancy, especially one without a rash. Um, too many care providers are not aware of the necessary testing to diagnose ICP. Like I said, even in my area of, uh, you know, uh, I live in a wealthy country, I live in Canada, you know, we don't actually have the necessary lab to uh, test for uh, fractionated bile acids. Um, my care providers didn't know it either, of course. I had to enlighten them and, and put studies under their noses. Um, and there's, there's just a, um, there's a lot of people who have 
for some reason miss that part of their education where they know about ICD. Uh, pruritus is often worse where there is prior damage to the skin. Um, so in ICP pregnancies, scars, tattoos, stretch marks. <clears throat> um, I find tattoos actually to be one of the key places where women start scratching first. Um, maybe the ink, I don't know, I don't know. I'm not going to, I guess I shouldn't um, uh, dream up a reason why that would be other than the fact that there was prior damage to that particular area. Uh, antihistamines are often um, cited as a thing that you can be given as a care provider, as a safe medication to give to women uh, with ICT to help control the symptoms, and they don't work. That's the way they say. <laughs> they don't work. <laughs> you can still try them, but no one's liking them. Uh, some women find they work, help with, um, with sleeping, but not with scratching. <clears throat> Uh, cyclical itching around ovulation and menstruation can plague ICP sufferers for years postpartum, um, which uh, can also be made worse by hormonal birth control. People in the know know that you uh, don't give hormonal birth control of any sort to women with a history of ICP. Um, someone can get away with uh, using it and not having their sy symptoms uh, come back, and, but most cannot. So midwifery-related issues, um, on a world scale, things are so different from one, um, uh, one country to another, uh, and uh, midwifery laws and midwifery climates and midwifery training are so different from one country to another that it's hard to address um, what actually to do, but if these are some questions you can consider. Can your clients still be considered for midwifery care, or do you need to co-manage? Can you even co-manage if, if you live in a country where you're, that is even possible to co-manage um, a client, or maybe she just needs to be cared for in a high-risk clinic? Uh, scope of practice for midwife changes dramatically um, from country to country or training to training. Um, so it depends also on your particular scope of practice. Uh, home birth. Um, you have to consider laws in your area for your own scope of practice. You have to consider informed consent, what your client thinks is okay. Um, is induction indicated or necessary? Uh, and if so, are you capable of inducing at home? Uh, what's your PTT? I really want to drive that home. <laughs> I really want to drive that one home. <laughs> if you're going to consider <laughs> Uh, home birth, check for PTT. Are you ready to deal with hemorrhage, even if the PTT is fine? What is your RDS protocol? That's a, um, a big risk, uh, especially if you're doing a, a borderline term, as I call it, induction. Because with uh, cholestasis, if an induction is indicated, it's often indicated early or at the, the edge of, uh, of term. So I know they changed, uh, the World Health Organization recently changed the, the um, definition of term to 38 weeks from 37. Um, so depending on your definition to, um, uh, it could be preterm induction, which perhaps should not be dealt with at home. Um, and do you have access to vitamin K? No, there are midwives who don't. For the newborn, or will, the, will your client have to go in to go and find some afterwards? Um, Yeah, the, those are just things to think about. Uh, this is another spot where I want to go back to the gland hepatology article um, where they talk about the difference between a severe case and uh, a mild case. And to me, that's a line. If, you're, if, uh, if your client is under, her bile acids are under 40 micromoles per liter, um, then her risks are not increased. And if they're above, should you be dealing with her anyway? It becomes a question. Uh, the take home message that I want to leave you guys with is you need to pay attention, <laughs> close attention to all itchy moms. And we can go back to the statistics where um, the, uh, no, no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, where women weren't, were treated uh, expectantly rather than uh, actively managed. 
where the statistic was 10 to 15 percent experiences IUSD, 10 to 15 percent of women with color faces. So if we think about the ones that were uh, neglected for whatever reason um, to be diagnosed, that number could be higher. So it's generalized itching without rash. Um, and then <laughs> generalized itching um, with excoriation marks. And you need to look to see what's the difference between a rash and an excoriation mark. And that sort of thing. I'd like to have pictures about that, but it's, uh, it's difficult. You have to ask questions. Yes, I have to ask a lot of questions. Um, a rash may come on from the itching as well. So you need to be asking which came first. Did you start scratching and then the rash appeared? Or are you scratching because you have a rash? And uh, you know, if she's scratching because she has a rash, then you might need a dermatologist. And <laughs> if you have a rash because you've been scratching, then you might need a hepatologist. <laughs> uh, the serum bile acid test, I think, um, I think the, this point on my slide is, drives it home. Please remember to do a serum bile acid test. Liver function tests are supportive but not diagnostic. Serum bile acid tests. Uh, and again, if you're considering your cold status client for home birth, do a PTT. Uh, resources for sufferers. I think these are all actually clickable. Um, uh, so there's a Facebook group, there's a Yahoo group. icpcare.org ICP, ICP is a fantastic website. It has resources for professionals, it has resources for the media, and resources for sufferers as well. It's a great website uh, to to go and peruse. And I hear someone's mic coming on to tell me something or other. Oh, maybe. <coughs> And then my last slide is uh, just uh, the articles I cited. Um, so I think uh, that's it for now. Does anybody oh. have any questions? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. So if people want to post uh, their questions up, um, I think there was a question earlier, wasn't there, about um, that was going to be you were going to raise just about the. Uh, the differences between somebody wasn't quite sure on the link between yeah, vitamin K. Yeah, vitamin K and the, the vitamin K um, issue with the cholestasis is uh, so if the liver is not functioning properly, there can be steatorrhea. So there's an increased amount of fat in the the colon, which is where the bacteria thrive that then die off and produce the vitamin K that we need um, uh, to survive on. Does that make sense? It's kind of long, <laughs> kind of long and rambly. So if the bacteria are being washed out because of steatorrhea, um, then we're not, they're not producing the vitamin K we need. So diet can maybe help fill some of that void. Um, but not necessarily all of it, depending on the severity of the symptoms. And of course, if the mother is um, clinically low on vitamin K, the newborn will be as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, one of the questions I was wondering was about, you know, you're mentioning about the 40 minimals of uh, bile acid, and if it was greater than 40, um, you were classed yeah. as having severe, um, you're having severe uh, cholestasis. D would the woman feel very different? Um, would it be experienced in her physical symptoms if it was greater than 40, or is that just a medical um, definition? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that either. Um, I'm not sure if there, I haven't come across any good research on that topic. Um, I have definitely noticed the difference between someone, how some women experience their uh, symptoms and itching. Um, so it may, it may or may not correlate to symptoms, the severity of the symptoms. Okay. And then I see someone saying, 
Yeah, there's a Is question. becoming more prevalent? I don't know if it's becoming more prevalent. I hope, I really hope it's being recognized more. Because when you see the studies from the 50s, they're, about, <laughs> they're clearly missing a lot of people. Um, I think, uh, I don't think it was recognized until the 90s. I don't think it's increasing. I mean, it could be increasing. Like, really, I don't know. Um, I do hope it's getting more and more um, recognition. But care providers are still are still slow. Help me up This is part of the reason I really wanted to do this presentation today to keep people in the know. You know. Um, I see a question about vitamin K. How do you give vitamin K to the mom? Well, I guess it depends on what model you use. Uh, I've definitely heard of um, moms being given um, uh, or your regular synthetic vitamin K1 injection. Um, it can also be given, uh, you know, as a supplement from the health food store. Um, and what else do we have? I know treatment should be individualized. Yeah, I didn't get into the treatment per se because of the time constraints, but also if, um, you know, if you're going to be using a medication yourself, you should be um, able to use the medication. You can't just learn it from Sarah Hunter on the Virtual International Day of the Midwest Conference. Um, it's got to be something you, you know a little bit about. Uh, the same with herbs. Um, uh, I definitely prefer people to refer their clients to somebody who is knowledgeable and trained in herbs before uh, playing with dosages uh, to look for um, a real response from them. With a decrease in vitamin K, how does this lead to increase in prothrombin? Are there less vitamin K to help this problem? Uh, yeah, well, they're, they're directly linked. Vitamin K and profound time, as far as my understanding goes. Um, okay, so any uh, other questions that people have? Oh, here's one from Megan, too. If you can only get uh, the total, uh, sorry, you can read. Yes, and if you can only get totals, I only manage to get totals by, by sending my um, stuff off to another province here uh, in Canada. Uh, I would use 40 as the cutoff as well. Yeah, definitely. There's not really a fractionated um, level for um, severe versus mild form of cases. Okay, so, oh, Mel's just got a, Mel's got a question <laughs> or a comment there. Yeah, and many supplements do, many pregnancy supplements do contain vitamin K. Um, if it's something you want to go towards for a co-status client, um, it's probably not enough. But again, it depends on symptoms and individual issues and postpartum, that's a good question actually that I didn't get into. Most women find that their symptoms um, are relieved fairly quickly postpartum, within a week or two. Some women still have signs and symptoms uh, up to a few weeks later and then other than that it just comes back down to um, again, hormonal increases of uh, ovulation or menstruation or being put on hormonal birth control where the signs and symptoms could come back. So it usually resolves quite quickly. Or at least the worst of it resolves almost immediately, like within 48 hours, and then um, increases uh, or decreases uh, as the days and weeks go on. Okay, well, we've got just a couple more minutes before we need to hand over for the preparation for the next talk. So I think there's just a couple more comments there uh, to look at. So, yes, follow-up follow LFTs and probably bilashes as well are recommended uh, until at the six weeks, sure, fine, that sounds legit. 
<laughs> but until they go back into the normal the normal range as well. So uh, LFTs may may or may not change during a cholestatic pregnancy. Uh, if they do change, they need, they need to be followed until they go back into a normal range, uh, however long that might take. Um, and sub the question about subsequent ICP pregnancies, yes, if you've had one, absolutely. You, the, the statistics, again, are all over the map for this, from, you know, 50% to 90%, but I think if you've had one ICP, ICP pregnancy, you're likely to have another, unless it was caused by um, the increased risk of having multiples or um, something specific to cause. And Sarah, uh, Sally uh, asked whether, well, she wonders if there's a link between poor diet um, at the start of pregnancy and ICP. I think uh, cholestasis, uh, the all liver disorders, I think it takes more than poor diet at the start of pregnancy. Um, I think uh, it's got to be a lot of poor diet if it's caused by diet at all. If it's related to diet at all in that individual, it's got to be more than just at the beginning of pregnancy that it's uh, where the issue comes from. Okay, well, I think we might need to uh, close this presentation now um, and get to okay. the next presenters can get ready. So thanks so much, Sarah, uh, for the enlightening presentation shared so much information in 40 minutes. So right, exactly. And so for more questions, I know people, sorry, people are still typing. Go to the icpcare.org link. They're fantastic. They'll answer everything for you. Yeah, honestly, thank, thank you, Sarah. Um, you can see everybody there thanking you for a brilliant presentation. And thanks also to people for their, their comments. Um, so hopefully you've had time now to, to write down those links or use those links that Sarah's got up there um, and have a look at her references. So I'm just going to turn off the cord now.